Michael, thank you for being here today. I'm very excited to do this interview. You have had quite the career. So you are now director of OSTP. For those who don't know, that's the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy um, in the Trump administration. You cover a wide range of technology, um, AI, quantum, nuclear energy, semiconductors, drones. So just a little bit of responsibility. But we're going to focus on AI, yep. selfishly because I'm an AI reporter, and because that is just the hot topic right now. Um, you've actually been thinking about AI policy since the pre-chat GPT days, <laughs> when you were in the first uh, President Trump administration, also working at the OSDP as CTO. You also have a background in the private sector, working for Peter Thiel. Um, you were most recently leading uh, policy at AI startup Scale AI. Uh, before returning to government. So I'm curious, what have you learned from your Silicon Valley days, and why are you excited to go back into government now? Yeah, so I started sort of my career in Silicon Valley in uh, 2010, and I was uh, with Peter and that team for seven years until joining, joining the first Trump administration. And there was a sort of interesting um, changing sort of face and nature of venture investing over those seven years. Those were the times when we were investing in um, SpaceX, Spotify, Airbnb, Stripe. Um, and as more and more of our companies came across our desks, what we would always be seeing was that the amount of time and energy that we were spending in thinking about the regulatory risk associated with those particular investments or how government or policy more broadly would affect those became a bigger, bigger part of our investment thesis. And to me, I'd always been passionate about, about policy. And to me, I, I deeply believe that, that policy actually plays a very, very important role in how quickly the United States can continue to lead and accelerate and win in these core, core technologies. Um, whether it's drones doing commercial uh, uh, delivery, whether it's supersonics flying again, whether it's nuclear power plants being, uh, being approved by the NRC, these are all sort of regulatory decisions that have to be made by government. And you can have the greatest technology in the world that you've invented in your, in your garage or even attempted to scale, but for many cases, um, unless the government gives you approval, you can't actually commercialize those. And um, as a country, uh, we definitely have to keep winning in these technologies. And the government has an important role to play in making sure we can unlock this for the American people. Any lessons that you learned from Silicon Valley that you're trying to bring to government? <laughs> Well, to, to me, I think in, in Silicon Valley, I guess when I was kind of with in, in those years uh, looking at a wide variety of technologies, I think, um, you know, we were always trying to look over the horizon and figure out what's next, what's the next big thing that we have to, we have to be thinking about and getting ahead of. And that's a lesson you definitely have to take into government. I mean, government is certainly not known for moving quickly or being particularly agile but especially when it comes to creating a regulatory environment which supports and encourages innovation in America, the people working on it have to be looking around the corner. They have to understand that a new technology is happening and the way that a current regulation is written or the way that a statute is currently drafted, there's gonna be a problem that's coming around the bend and it's, and it's really important that you kind of get in front of those uh, and, and make sure that it's not a problem. I'll give you one sort of minor example we think about a lot is, uh, is supersonic flight. Um, with supersonic flight, the current rule on the book is a speed limit. You are, it is illegal to fly over uh, Mach 1 over co the continental United States. Now, there have been companies out there that have demonstrated what they believe that they can fly over Mach 1 without creating a sonic boom. Now, that may, if that's actually true, and that it doesn't create a noise issue by flying over Mach 1, that rule is totally antiquated. So at some point, someone will be able to create a, a commercial supersonic uh, airplane that doesn't create a, a sonic boom, and, uh, and the regs just aren't there to allow it. So that's just a minor example, but it kind of extends along a, a wide variety of technologies. So there are many uh, prominent uh, tech community leaders who have gone on to advise in this White House administration, mm -hmm. David Sachs, and of course, Elon Musk probably being right the most prominent. Right now, just today, we're seeing a fallout sort of happen between Musk and the president. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of that? Well, I can't speak to, to that particular instance, but, but I will say, uh, <laughs> I will say generally uh, what the president has enabled it to is assemble an unbelievable coalition of Americans that are committed to ushering in a golden age of American innovation. We're at a point in American history where we have the choice as Americans and as a government 
to bring these new technologies to bear for the benefit of the American people. And what's so unique about this particular election versus ones many years ago is that folks who may not necessarily have been considered to be on the same team a few years ago are all now united behind a president to drive to drive this innovation for the country. And, and that's why I go to work every day, and that's why great patriots like David Sachs work alongside me to get that done, and, and we're excited for the team we built. All right, let's move on to some other news of the day. Um, there is a controversial provision in the current congressional funding bill to ban states from regulating AI for 10 years. Um, we're seeing some bipartisan opposition to that particular provision. Recently, uh, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene and Senator Ed Markey have called for its removal, um, along with a big group of state lawmakers. What do you think? Do you think that the federal governments or the state governments should regulate AI? So generally, this has been a problem with tech regulation for many years. I think probably the most famous sort of fight in the sort of preemption debate, if you will, was around uh, privacy regulations. And for many years, there was you know, lots and lots of attempts at the federal level to create comprehensive privacy legislation for the entire country. And there was unable ever to get the 60 votes in the Senate. And what ultimately happened is California kind of ushered, ushered in privacy legislation that very much mirrored what was happening in Europe. And then other states tried to do it. And what you generally tend to see is that um, there are significant downsides to a patchwork of individual state regulations. It creates sort of, it makes it very challenging often for the smaller upstart players to be able to successfully commercialize across the United States because they have to comply with 50 different sets of rules. Um, so I think generally, you know, I'm a supporter in, 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 in instances where federal preemption does make sense. So you can create an environment where all players, big and small, can succeed. Um, I don't think the very large tech players have uh, any problem hiring enough lawyers to make it all work at all the states. But I think for, for smaller players, you know, preemption can make a really, really big difference in, in spurring innovation. So we'll see how that's playing out. From what I understand, the Senate is now working through an alternative version to what the House proposed in the bill that was passed um, last week. So we'll see what they come up with, and hopefully there can be a compromise between the two chambers. So I want to talk about the change and sort of the tone of policy on AI from this current administration compared to the past. In recent months, it feels like we've moved from conversations about AI safety and the role of government to protect that more and more toward AI opportunity um, in what I believe you've called the golden age of American innovation. So why do you think we're seeing this shift away from safety? And what do you say to those who remain concerned about the downsides of AI, everything from bias in AI systems to potentially catastrophic risks to humanity? Yeah, it's been, for those of you who sort of track this intersection of sort of AI technological progress and then the policy piece of it, you know, the arc kind of began in, in the first Trump administration. Uh, president Trump was the first president in history to ever sign an executive order on artificial intelligence. That was in 2019, where this was well before ChatGPT came out, where the president said, this is one of the most important technologies for the future of our country uh, and for the American worker, and we have to put a strategy in place to drive that forward. And he prioritized research and development, did a bunch of work on workforce development, and was able to sort of pr promulgate the first ever regulatory guidance on, on, on AI in, in 2020. What we saw over time was sort of this, this optimism about how powerful this technology could be to sort of help the American people, empower American workers, drive economic growth, was sort of, um, as, as we moved into the, the post ChatGPT era, a lot of leaders who were in that LLM space, you know, ran to the Hill, and, and the, many of you may remember this, sort of all the, the tone of many of the early uh, Senate and House hearings were very much about sort of the, the risks associated with AI. There was this general sort of infatuation with, with trying to identify what's the worst possible thing that could go wrong. And they went as far as even claiming maybe we should have a whole new sort of agency or, or regulatory commission to oversee artificial intelligence. But over time, I think what the bipartisan consensus started to, to come into place that sort of in reality, artificial intelligence is a ubiquitous technology that's going to be touching all sorts of different applications, whether you're flying drones, whether you're driving autonomous cars, whether you're developing AI-powered medical diagnostics, this is a technology that's going to be part of that, um, part of that new technological um, breakthrough that you're making. So in a sense, from a regulatory front, the best, you know, the best in way to actually approach this is to maintain kind of a, a industry or sector-specific, use case-specific approach to regulation. 
So the same regulators that are regulating vehicle safety should be regulating autonomous vehicles. The same people at FDA who are approving medical diagnostics should be approving AI-powered medical diagnostics. And you just sort of, sort of increase the bubble or the, or, um, of that particular regulatory agency. And I think on top of it, I think you, you had an administration uh, in the prior administration that was sort of infatuated with discussing sort of the fears or the problems that may come about of AI. And I think what this led to was a total, a, a really negative tone around what this technology could provide and ultimately set kind of a groundwork that, that you know, if it had continued, I think would have put the U.S. in a, in a real disadvantage to our global competitors. What we're trying to do in this administration is we understand that there will be changes that artificial intelligence will bring to the country. We understand that there's certain things that we need to be monitor and track. But at the end of the day, we're in a, in a global race, and we need to be able to lead in that race and, as the as a president says, maintain unquestioned and unchallenged global technological dominance. And with that, that is how we can impart all the benefits of American people and ensure that globally, because I know we may get to this, is we want the world to be running on the American AI stack. And Vice President um, uh, Vance was in Paris in the first couple weeks of the administration. He talked about the importance of this gold standard AI. We have the best AI in the world here in the U.S., and we need to make sure that we continue to lead on it. So your mandate is to make sure that the U.S. stays ahead mm -hmm. on AI. With the launch of DeepSeek right this winter, that was a wake-up call for everyone about just how close Chinese AI is to that here in the U.S., what are you doing to maintain that lead? And how are you doing that as you're also dealing with restrictions on student visas, on immigration that do impact the talent, the talent pipeline mm -hmm. here in Silicon Valley? Yeah, I think in reality it was a wake up call that the policies of the last four years ultimately didn't make a difference in ensuring that the US maintains its leadership position. For many years we heard that the specific export control regime that was put in place by the prior administration that was extraordinarily bespoke and detailed, these like thousand page rules that were put, being put out by the Commerce Department restricting very specific rules because the very specific uh, chips and tools, that was the way that we were gonna slow down, um, slow down what the PRC was trying to do. And in reality, that didn't, didn't happen. What we saw just a few, uh, a few weeks after we were inaugurated was, was deep sea coming into place. And I think what that shows is the imperative of of a both a promote and protect strategy. If you are singularly focused on trying to do the protect piece, which is trying to identify the tooling and the chips that you want to restrict from China, that alone is not enough. Should we continue to explore that and make sure that we're not giving someone who has you know, declared to the world they want to surpass us the tools they need? Absolutely. But at the same time, you have to accelerate and push forward U.S. innovation and dominance. And what that means is continue to invest in research and development around artificial intelligence. Think about how you can remove regulatory barriers to AI innovation. Do not create a culture where AI innovators believe that they're going to be regulated out of existence. And I think third and most importantly, it's a big focus of our agenda, is the adoption question. How can we as a government encourage adoption across the country writ large? Because even if we have the very, very best model in the world that's leading on every benchmark you can imagine, if the government isn't using it, if the DOD isn't using it, if the intelligence community isn't using it, if American consumers aren't using it, if American industry isn't using it, why does it even matter that we have the best model? So adoption is so, so key to driving that leadership position. And how should companies manage when that talent pipeline is being potentially impacted by immigration restrictions, as well as some of the research grants are being cut to NSF and others. Do you, what do you say to concerns that that could weaken our AI industry? Yeah, I think what's really exciting about the president's budget he proposed a few weeks ago was that while we're trying to right size the budget to make sure that we're investing in the most important areas for the United States, one area that we have protected and there have been no downside changes to are around our AI and our quantum budgets. We believe that these are sort of core technological areas that we need to lead on and we're going to continue to do that. I think for companies, what I always challenge everyone to say is they are extraordinarily brilliant and bright Americans and I urge every company out there to go out and seek those and find them because they're excited to work, excited to be part of the technological revolution and help America lead. So your office uh, put out a request for comments on an AI plan that you're going to put out next month. Yes. You received 10,000 comments, and that's both from major companies like OpenAI as well as everyday people who have thoughts about what our government should be doing on AI policy. 
Can you tell us what some of your key takeaways were and give us a sneak peek of what you want to focus on in this action plan coming up? Yeah, this is very exciting. On January 23rd, a couple days after inauguration, the president signed executive order uh, asking me, David Sachs, and the National Security Advisor, um, Secretary Rubio, to deliver to him a, an AI uh, national strategy, if you will, an AI action plan within 180 days. For those who are counting, that is July 23rd. So we're getting closer to that, to that big date. Um, the first thing we did, as you said, go out and did an RFI and got uh, people to, to give us comments on what should be included in this. And I think we were kind of blown away by the number of responses we got, as you said, over, over 10,000. And also, the, the, and it was not only AI companies, American citizens, we had people from Hollywood and actors, all sorts of people you could imagine are sort of weighing in on this. Again, the, the general trends that we are seeing is that in order to drive U.S. leadership in this domain, you have to do a balanced promote and protect strategy. You have to continue to focus on research and development. You have to continue to create a regulatory environment that encourages innovation, not discourages it. You have to promote adoption. You have to promote workforce development that allows Americans from all shapes and sizes, all types of industries to utilize this technology. Sometimes when people think about AI or maybe 10, you know, 15 years ago, the talk was all about coding and sort of CS was just for a small subset of people that were studying computer science. The reality is no matter what you're doing, you could be a historian, you could be an electrician, you know, you could be a lawyer, you will be using artificial intelligence in your job. So it's like adoption question is so, so key. And I know I keep repeating it, but it's critical because it's going to span across so many different industries. And then on the protect side, we have to be really smart and understand what are the tools that we have developed as Americans that we need to protect and be careful that our adversaries don't try to take advantage of them or steal them from us. What keeps you up at night the most about AI, and what are you most excited about? I'm going to sound like a broken record. What keeps me up at night is that we are not adopting fast enough. There, are Everyone in this room, I'm sure, is using AI all the time. You're encouraging the use of that technology in a particular company. But this country is huge. We have 350 million Americans that do all sorts of things across all sorts of industries. And we have to encourage them to continue to use this technology, because this is what's going to empower them to do their jobs better, safer, faster, more efficiently. And I think it could spur tremendous economic growth for all of us. So to me, I think what keeps me up at night is that we're not moving fast enough on the adoption, and we're just too fixated on kind of the leaderboard of some of these LLMs. I think you had a second part to that question. What are you most excited about? Uh, what, and what, do you personally use AI tools? Uh, I do. I do. What do you use them for? And which ones? I, you know, I use all. Very, we have lots of great American models, as I can say. We we lead the world in our LM, so I try to use as many of them as I possibly can. But I think from everything, from cooking at home to helping work on policy and do research, I think these are these are really really tremendous tools. To me, what I'm most optimistic excited about and have been recently is AI and education. The president signed executive order about a month ago, um, putting together a package of ways that we can support AI education across K through 12. And to me, AI is going to transform the way that Americans learn. And again, because this is a tool that you'll use, whether you're a graphic designer or a lawyer or a doctor, being able to understand how to wield these tools in your K through 12 education to then go out into the workforce and be able to leverage them is so, so key. Um, so we're going to be launching a, a big AI presidential challenge that's going to culminate an event in the White House next fall, next spring. We'll bring a lot of these students to, to the White House to really showcase all the great things you can do with AI. So I'm excited for AI and education. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.